Uh, my name is Philip Carter. I am a principal product manager at Honeycomb, and I take my coffee home roasted because I buy beans and then I roast them at home and I make espresso with it. Okay, we are back for another MLOps Community Podcast. I am your host, Dimitri Ost. Today I'm flying solo and we're talking with Philip Carter of Honeycomb. As you saw, he got on my radar because of the incredible blog post that he wrote on the Honeycomb blog talking about the hard parts or the parts that people don't usually highlight, especially not on Twitter when you're talking about your AI demos and how it's this revolutionary new AI product. Well, he is actually using LLMs in production and we go over all of that in the conversation today. We talk about some of the challenges that they encountered. And I absolutely loved the conversation that we had around how they measure the ROI of their open API calls. It was nice to see that he had tangible numbers and he also had leading metrics that they looked at. And so they saw that if we're able to affect these metrics in a tangible way, then it makes all of the OpenAI API calls that we're doing worth it because we know that in theory, more people that are able to activate by taking these actions in our app, they become paying customers and they're able to subsidize the cost of these OpenAI costs. So enough of me talking about this. Let's just get right into it. I hope you all enjoy the conversation that I had with Philip Carter. And I will mention that if you have not given us a review or at least liked this podcast yet, what are you doing? It means the world to us. If you share this with one person, one person only that you think would find value in it, it would be a huge help to help us grow and get the word out about the ML Ops community, or these days, might as well call it the LLM Ops community. No, I'm joking. We are not going to change it because, let's be honest, it's all ML Ops. At the end of the day, we're just trying to navigate this uncharted territory together, and there's a lot to learn. I hope you enjoy the rest of this podcast. Let's take it off. I'm excited for you to be on here with us today. This is, it's been uh, some time in the making. I know we had to reschedule and I was having problems and then it was 4th of July and things happened. So we had the persistence though to make this happen and I already know it's going to be great. And so thank you for coming on here. Yeah, thanks for having me. So you said you wanted a insightful conversation from this and you want me to ask you some hard questions. Now, when it comes to the blog that you wrote, you threw out a lot of things that I think many of us were thinking, but you articulated it in a way that really rallied the internet and everyone who has been playing around with AI behind you. And so it struck a chord. It, and I, I was rereading it just again today, and there's so many pieces that I want to pick out and mention and talk about. But... Before we do that, I think it's probably right to start with your position and your company and how you're using AI. Yeah, absolutely. Even though I, I don't really have an ML background, I've been involved in a couple of like ML projects tangentially in, in my career, uh, like a little bit at Microsoft. And, and now I work for Honeycomb, which is an observability company. Um, you can think of it as like it's data analysis for information about applications that are running in production and so sort of like an evolution of you know like apm monitoring stuff that that a lot of the industry uses today and so i've i've been actually involved a lot i'm, I'm a maintainer in the open telemetry project which is around the idea of creating open standards for generating data about things that are running in production so that developers can sort of own their data and and take it to like the tool of choice rather than get locked into a particular vendor or something. Um, and so our product is about, we, we take that data and we, we let you analyze it. And and in fact, in, in Honeycomb itself, uh, everything is about querying that data. And you could argue that um, every major pillar of our product 
is an act of querying in some way, whether it's like you're literally writing out the query itself in our product, or there's a thing that like runs a query on a cron job, or there's a different kind of query that's sort of running ambiently and surfaces certain things. Um, and so one thing that we found is we have a good product market fit with SREs and platform engineers, and that's great. It's like the right shape product for them. But for your average software developer or even a product manager or someone who like has a vested interest in things running well in production uh, struggles with the act of querying because it's it's not that like it's the hardest thing in the world, but like it's an unfamiliar kind of tool. And they're like, OK, I don't know how to make heads or tails of this, so I'm just going to leave. And when we talk to new users, they're like, well, we have a mental model of kind of like in our heads, what we think makes sense. And golly, if there were just some technology out there that could take <clears throat> like my natural language representation of what I care about and turn it into a honeycomb query that could then run. And as luck would have it, uh, right around that time, ChatGPT came out and it was far too expensive for us to use the, the APIs that a couple months later, they, they reduced their prices by the two orders of magnitude. And so I was like, well, Natural language querying looks like it's in now, so let's let's hop on it. So um, we just went full steam ahead. You know, then we just went into the thick of it, and we gave ourselves a month, and we said, okay, we're gonna ship this live to everybody, um, as good as we can possibly make it within a month, and that's that's it. And it was really really ambitious, and we ran into a lot of problems along the way, and we had to ship with embarrassing lack of features that like we've since added but you know that's that's the nature of fast product development and yeah we're we're using just llms as an api but even within that there's just like a mountain of complexity and and nuance to that 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 we were able to uncover and so we wanted to sort of share that story of like hey we did it for real and our goal was to get it out to everyone not like create like a little fake um early access thing that you know makes it seem like everything is good and then you go live later and you find out it's dog shit so Yes, the refreshingly real take was really what resonated with me. And so just to zone in or double click on the idea of taking natural language in the background, basically you were doing the natural language to SQL or was it to another? How were you querying it? Was it to a coding language or was it just hitting the API and giving it context? So there, there's a couple things. So first, a honeycomb query is actually a JSON specification of like a thing against our query engine that runs. So the honeycomb querying interface that we call it manual querying is sort of like a visual programming language and less like, you know, SQL or, okay. or PromQL or something like that. So, so like the goal was take natural language input and produce a JSON spec that matches, you know, this, this format basically that has all these rules associated with it. And yeah, with that, we, we, we pull a lot of things as context along with that. So we have this notion of called data set definitions. For a given data set that you want to query, you can have something like a canonical representation of an error column. By default, that'll be a name called error and it's a Boolean. And like when Honeycomb sees that in data, it'll be like, I'm just going to assume that this means the errors. And so any part of the product that deals with errors is going to assume that that's what it is. But you might have a data set where you want a different canonical representation of errors. You want it, maybe it's a string and you want to have it be just error messages instead of like whether something was an error or not. Yeah. And so there's a way to configure that. So we take that into consideration for like when somebody asks something related to errors, if there's a Boolean error column and if there's a string error column, we know which one is the canonical representation and we go with that rather than the other one. And and the model seems to be very, very good at sort of picking up on that on that nuance. It reminds me because you, you mentioned the pains of working with JSON structures. We mentioned it a little bit. It's it's it takes quite a bit of effort to to get these models to conform to output that you want. And Granted, that I think that's gotten better now with the the function calling updates that uh, OpenAVI has added, where you sort of specify, okay, this is like the shape of the input that I want to pass to a function, and it'll get it to conform to that shape. However, I've been playing with that, and it's not a silver bullet either. I, I feel like I need another blog post here that's yeah. like, hey, update. They, they did something that <laughs> solves the problem in one way, but makes it harder in another. Yeah. Uh, 
which, which is so we have this constraint where you know we need to spec we need to output a, a JSON object that follows a particular format, but we need to support a very wide variety of potentially ambiguous inputs where mm. somebody like we literally see this people type in errors or traces or like so a, a trace in in um in distributed tracing there there's like these unique identifiers that sort of represent like here's all the things that that represent this this trace that flows through a system um they will have another tool that will grab that unique identifier they'll just paste that into the box and hit enter and oh. it's like okay what query is supposed to come out of like a 16 byte hex encoded value like yeah. it, it, <laughs> okay but like it's better to show something than than nothing and mm -hmm. so you know with with the with the apis that we're using which is not using function calling we're able to generally produce something and when we tried it with the function calling updates it ended up not producing anything a lot more because it was right. like oh well i don't know how to get this to conform to the shape and so it might be that our current prompting techniques are not actually suitable for the function calling stuff, but then that feeds back to another point that I had in the blog post about how like prompt engineering is not easy. It's a total wild west thing. And you know, what's going to work for one thing is not necessarily going to work for the other thing. So that's exactly what I was going to talk about with the function calls and this new capability. It definitely seems like it's a dark art and I've mentioned it before. It is like, even on the function calls, you can just say oh you change the order of these words or you flip flop these words and you get much more consistent output and unless you're very very good at this or you just spend a lot of time messing with the prompt you don't actually figure that out and so it feels like you can spend more time trying to figure out the prompt than if you if you try and do this the old school way yeah yeah and and i think one thing that we learned after the release and so we basically we had this initial month to get something out there and then we gave ourselves another month to just iterate with what was in production to try to make it as good as we could and take it out of experimental mode and you know make it live ga quality i guess which is which is what we have now um what we learned is that once you're in production the fastest thing you can do is just literally look at the inputs and outputs of like this is what users are doing over the past 24 hours. These were all the user inputs. These were all of the LLM outputs that came from that output. And then this is the results of our like parsing and validation system that tries to take that LLM output and, and you know, um, we parse it and, and there's like a potential kinds of errors that can happen there. And then we try to execute it against our querying engine. Um, and we learned that it's a lot faster to just work with that data directly because now we're no longer in a hypothetical world. We're like, all right, this is what people are literally trying right now. Yeah. And um, when you're in that core iteration loop, like I think the challenge that you run into is you you work yourself into a local maxima of like how good your prompt is. Um, but I think that if if it's based off of what users are actually doing that local maxima is probably good enough and you don't have to tie yourself into knots trying to figure out like ooh, or let's explore this brand new prompting technique or like you can but you're like you're basically buying yourself some time there because if you make it good enough for the majority of people then you're like okay we can sit back and we can be really exploratory with all the different prompting techniques that exist out there and we can take some of that data from like okay now we've got it to a point where it looks like it's looking pretty good let's take a snapshot of that let's build an evaluation system for offline model running and say like, okay, now like we can have some guess as to if we're going to regress what's in production or not. And let's go wild with prompting techniques. But like, I think it's really, really hard to front load that stuff because you don't have that actual user input that you're working with. And so you're just taking shots of the dark, you know, instead of, you know, you might be more methodical with your prompting, but you're taking shots in the dark in terms of like, okay, but like, what are the actual inputs to this going to be? so good you mentioned how people were just pasting in error or asking error or traces what are some other things that you saw from the data and were you doing this manually were you just kind of looking through what people were seeing or were you actually going through and trying to write code i imagine it's a ton of data that you're going through but also at the same time the manual aspect might help you pick out some of these patterns 
Yeah. So, um, so briefly to, to answer your first question, I think my favorite class of inputs is we have this one customer who's like, they're actually like our heaviest user customer of all of Honeycomb period. And they were like, ironically, the one customer I didn't let using this feature up front because there were all these like problems that they would totally run into. And they were, they're the heaviest users, which is like, oh shit. Okay. Of course. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but at any rate, uh, so Honeycomb has this feature called derived column, or you can think of it like computed column or computed field. The idea is it's a DSL where you can write an expression that takes values and columns that exist in your data set and produce sort of this, this computed column that's made up of the other ones. And it has its own syntax. And they were pasting in just like expressions from that syntax into the the editor and actually getting useful queries. We have like a little feedback mechanism where you can say like, was this result good? Yes, no, not sure. And they pasted in like this huge computed expression field thing. And the answer they gave back was yes. And I'm like, okay, I don't, that makes no sense to me, but whatever. <laughs> So that was that's probably the wildest, and like it, uh, we have like a little um, stream of of inputs that I'll that I'll sort of look at from time to time, and it still comes up. It, it like apparently it works. Some emerging capability in this system that we built that we had no idea about. It makes sense though, because that kind of is one of the patterns that you see. Like, oh, there's an error message. Let's just throw this back into the LLM and see what they make of it, and then I don't have to go through and try and debug it on my own. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or or they take like things that they knew they could sort of do and they 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 treat it as like a shorthand and it tends to work out okay. But but so to to your second question about how we're looking at this information so we can see how we're going to deal with it. There's two things that I think are really important here. So we have we have this instrumented pretty well. I actually have another blog post that talks about some of the things that we did there where we capture about a dozen or two dozen or so fields for a given request in a uh, in a span that exists in a trace in our production data. So like broadly, it captures what the user input was, what the LLM output was, what the error was if it came from open API, uh, open AI, what the error was if it came from like our own parsing and validation system. Um, some metadata about like we use embeddings to like pull out a subset of fields in a schema so we don't have to pass the entire schema. Um, some metadata about like, you know, how much that was pulled out and like what the actual names of those fields were. It's like the top 50 um, and and things like that. And so that allow. and then we also have a response. So like if they gave us feedback, like the yes, no, or unsure, uh, we also capture that. And so we can we can sort of slice and dice that data and group things arbitrarily. Oh, and also one other thing, we have like these little bubbles at the button bottom that you can click that are suggested natural language queries, just to kind of give new users an idea of the sorts of things they can ask. And we track like if the thing that they gave us was like a suggested query or a written query. And then we group by our by frequency of pretty much all of these kinds of different fields. So like one of the most common ones is grouping by open AI error and then grouping by parsing error. And uh, it turns out there's some patterns that emerged very, very quickly, where a very common one that we found was if we grouped by our parsing errors, because there's rules for like pieces of a query, like, you know, this thing can only work when this thing is present, or, you know, like this thing does not take a column as input or something like that. One of the more common ones that we found where people were asking some variant of what is my error rate? And we kept emitting something that like, I could see why the LLM would emit that, but it was definitely the wrong thing to emit. Uh, and it was a very common kind of error. And we're like, okay, this is like through prompt engineering, we could probably solve this. And so it took us a little bit because it was a little it was a little tricky, but then we did that. And then a week later, we have this thing that tracks like what our, what our errors are of the query assistant thing itself. And we noticed the error rate went down and the success, we call it a success rate, but the su- su- success rate went up by about 6%. And so we're like, okay, that was... That was just a legit improvement right there. Um, and that was just, that was a very, very simple query within Honeycomb. We literally just like looked at this data and then we grouped by our like parsing error thing. And we just, it grouped by frequency. So we just saw the top one and, and we're like, all right, the, like the, the top five were all this error. And then there were like, you know, certain kinds of inputs that people would put in. We're like, all right, cool. This is a pattern. 
Awesome. Yeah. Moving on. And we would oh, repeat that again and again. And we eventually got to the point where these errors that we saw were entirely unique and we're like, okay, like we're getting diminishing returns now on doing this sort of thing. So let's like pause on this improvement cycle for a little bit and see what happens. And so that that's, we use honeycomb for all of this. So like we're dog fooding our product nice. for our, our feature that we just got out there. Awesome. As I would hope you would be doing. And so if you look at where you're at right now with the feature and you look at where you started at, how much of an improvement do you think you've had since releasing this feature? And then how much room do you still feel like you have to grow? That's a good question. So the first part of it, I can actually quantify. So uh, part of what Honeycomb's product offers is what's called a service level objective or an SLO. The idea is that it's a measure that gets computed over a particular interval as pass or fail. And you set up like what your success threshold is. And then it calculates a budget of failures, basically based off of your success rate over a specified time window that you care about. So if you're like, okay, I have this operation, I want it to succeed at a minimum 95% of the time over seven days. And so it calculates, all right, there's a, there's a, there's a, just based off of the amount of like events that come in, there's a, there's a number of failures that you're allowed before you've, you sort of failed this service level objective. And so what we did is when we first released this, we just, we had no idea what, what would be good or bad. So we just set a service level objective of 75% over seven days. So we said, okay, a quarter of, of inputs are going to result in a failure of some kind. That was our, our, our initial thinking. And that is kind of how it played out. It was slightly better. It was 76 or 77%. Oh, wow. I would have said that's a little optimistic. It, yes. Well, well, I mean, we dog fooded it a lot internally and we were actually feeling pretty good. So we're like, okay, let's do 75%. And then uh, as, as we iterated uh, that number, we could see that actually that rate, that success rate go up on this service level objective. And so we got it up to about 94% is I think where we're sitting at right now. And that was, that was through just what I mentioned earlier, like going through looking at errors that people are experiencing and noticing patterns, doing prompt engineering, doing like manual corrections as well. So like sometimes the LLM, I'll put something that's like basically correct. And uh, so we're like, all right, well, we, we, we see this, we literally know how to fix this like statically. So let's just fix it instead of uh -huh. trying to, you know, do some hyper focused prompt engineering stuff. Yeah. And, uh, combining these two techniques, we got up to almost a 95%, like always gets a query output that, that is runnable. And we're, we're pretty happy with that. So, so like that, that, that's, that's where some of these observability practices, like setting up a service level objective and seeing how, like you can observe how this changes over time really, really helps. Yeah. Makes complete sense. And I, I do want to dive into one other piece when it comes to the feature that you set up, which is that you are not using it as a chat bot, which I, I personally love because we had a talk at the first LLMs in production conference where Linus Lee from Notion talked about how, you know, is the future of interacting with LLMs chat or is there some better user experience and user interface? And I think you all did that. What he talked about in his talk, you did it intuitively where you said, you know what, we're not going to let someone just ask any question in the world. We've got these boxes that you can prompt, but it's not like a chatbot type experience. Can you break that down and what your rationale behind that was? Yeah, definitely. So we actually had an early prototype that was a chatbot and it actually had way more scope than what we ended up shipping with. Not only could it output a honeycomb query, but it could also explain like a general question you have about honeycomb observability stuff. And it could also output a hypothetical query. So like, imagine that you want to ask about errors, but your application has never emitted an error before, which happens a lot with new users who are instrumenting like a really basic app. 
there's no possible query for errors that you could create if it's not admitted an error yeah. because there's no there's no error columns. But that doesn't mean no query should be possible. So like, you know, what what do you do there? Well, we had this sort of mode of like it would it would try to chat with you about like, hey, so I'm not able to create a query from this. But that's because you're missing the data to be able to create a query for this. And if you had columns of like this name, the query could look like this. So like you should go and like add that to to your code or something. We ended up scoping that out because that was a big can of worms of complexity. Like there were all kinds of weird behaviors that it was doing. Uh, we didn't throw the idea out. I think it's something we're gonna eventually build, but it didn't seem like it was necessary for an initial release because especially when we talked with our sales team, they were like, hey, so people in our experience don't seem like they wanna chat with something. They just wanna get a honeycomb query as fast as possible. And so we're like, okay, okay let's just focus on doing that specifically. And then we sort of started realizing like chat isn't actually the right modality for this problem because, or it could potentially be, it's, it's, it's kind of tricky. So, so like with honeycomb query, the way that you generally try to query your data is you try to start broad and then you start narrowing down with your query until you get to like a subset of the data where you're like, all right, cool. This is specifically what I'm into. It could be like you're you're you got paged for an incident, and so you're like you're starting with errors, but now you're scoping down to a very specific part of a very specific service, and like that's the thing that's responsible. You're like, cool, I understand what's going on now. To an extent, chat could hypothetically work with that, where you could sort of you ask it a thing, it outputs a thing, and then you say, okay, but like what if you do this, and then it outputs a different thing, and so on. But we found that with people internally at Honeycomb, what they wanted to do is the query would like fill out the UI. So you would see in the honeycomb query UI, here's all these like things that we're grouping by and filtering by. Is there like, oh, well, I can just like click in these things and like manually query now that you've sort of created the thing to start out with. And there was that tendency to people to be like, oh, well, I don't want to like go back to a chat box to ask it a thing. I just want to click on the thing that like, now that the UI has been filled out for me, it's yeah. faster for me to just go and click around. And that that felt right to us. And then as we started getting into productionizing this thing and getting into prompt injection attacks, we're like, Good. oh, a chatbot is an end user reprogrammable system where they can they can use that rapid feedback of textual input and output to manipulate the system behind the scenes. And that was kind of freaky, especially since we're dealing with a lot of different data, like, you know, somebody could be trying to do some sort of like data exfiltration technique or something like that. And, you know, we're going to try to build as many, uh, or we, we built as many um, protections about that as we could, but a lot of it really comes down to like, how annoying is it for a bad actor to do bad things? Man. And what we built was actually really annoying for somebody to do bad things with. Yeah, that's classic. That it, And that's great that you thought about it and you saw that problem because I imagine it's really hard to just safeguard everyone's data when you are sending things to open AI and how do you make sure that there's a clear line that is the different customers data and how they use it. And if someone wants to, and they're good at it because this is such a new toy that we're playing with and technology that it's really hard to stay ahead of the curve. And so I, th I think about that one, and I also know that you all spent a lot of cycles on the whole prompt injection thing. What made you do that? Were people trying to break it from the get-go, or was that you dogfooding it and trying to break it? It started out with us, but then we also reached out to a person who used to work for Honeycomb, who now had, like, he has his own startup. He's kind of like on a preferred, you know, you know, he, he knows everything about the product. He like, you know, he's, he's rooting for us, all that kind of stuff. We're like, Hey, try to break this thing. And, um, he knew like who some of our top customers were. And that's like literally what he was starting to put in there was oh. like, and give me wow. data from, you know, customer name. Oh, wow. And we're like, okay. It, we're like, all right. Like he's, he's, he's a good actor in this. Like we, we all trust each other. We're all friends. Like it's all good. But if it's easy enough for him to just ask for that sort of thing, it's going to be easy enough for an actual, an actual bad actor who we, we get, we actually, we get that quite a bit. Um, in fact, there are a lot of, we see like in a lot of attributes on data coming in, if you group by least frequent unique values, there's all these sort of like fields that are supposed to be normally filled in with like 
normal metadata that'll have like script tags and a whole bunch of different stuff. And so like people are like trying to attack our stuff. Oh wow. Um, oh wow. So <laughs> like that that kind of that kind of freaked me out a little bit. Yeah. So we we thought about it and there were a few things that we did. So firstly, um, we we parse all outputs of a large language model. And so that's not that's not gonna solve everything, but if you have to parse something, you tend to just drop a whole bunch of garbage that ends up not fitting the particular thing you're trying to parse into. Ops. You have to immerse yourself in the ML Ops content. The best way to do it is to subscribe to the Email Ops Community Podcast. So, good luck and keep learning. Uh. Secondly, we have our own set of protections to protect against like SQL injection and a bunch of other stuff when we actually execute a query. And executing a query doesn't like run something against a database directly. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes on. And so uh, there's that. The large language model itself is not interacting directly with our main database that like pulls in, you know, like user info and team info and, and you know, validate this API key and stuff like that. It doesn't interact with that at all. And we, we sort of have it like sandbox in a way because of that. We then also uh, rate limit users. So, you know, like that's that's kind of the core loop that bad actors have is they're they're constantly iterating. And if you only get a certain amount of tries each day, well, there you go. And uh, it turns out most people, when they're using this legitimately, don't ever go above like 25 or so uses. Uh, the rate limit isn't 25 anymore. We were able to update it a little bit more, but it started out with 25. And again, like it doesn't solve everything, but if you only have so many tries a day, well, there you go. Another one is limiting the amount of input that you pass in. So again, turns out most people, when they ask a natural language query, are not going to produce that much text that needs to get turned into, you know, tokens that goes against the large language model. Forget all So we have prior, a set limit. Yeah. I could totally see that you're yeah. starting to be like, oh, that is obviously a prompt injection attempt because it's very clear when somebody says, <laughs> do not obey the last or, you know, do anything now that I say they're taking the hottest topics off of Reddit and they're trying to inject it into their. Yeah. And, and so um, and then the last one is also just parameterizing the prompt itself. And I think it's also, well, it, there's sort of two things with the prompt. So like you want to parameterize your your inputs. And again, that doesn't solve everything, but it, it kind of makes it a little bit less likely. And we have in our prompt, it's sort of, there, there's a lot of this like simulated conversation that goes on where it's like simulated user input, simulated LLM output, input, output, input, output. And it's like this pattern. And I think like it sort of orients the LLM to just sort of be like, oh, well, I need to be in that pattern. I can't just like emit random garbage. Mm -hmm. And um, I think when you combine all of these things together, you have something that is too difficult to get really juicy info out of. And so it's just not worth the effort. Like there's there's plenty more companies out there haphazardly yeah. throwing chatbots over their databases that you can just go after instead. Yeah. There's much lower hanging fruit, so go to the, one of those and figure out which ones they are. It, you're, it's time better spent. And so I, I just want to come back and close the loop on the idea of the UI because I find that fascinating. And I think that being able to really narrow down the scope is something that is a little bit of, uh, it's undervalued when it comes to LLMs because the LLMs have this gigantic surface area that they cover, right? And you can ask it for a poem on the meaning of life or what King Henry's second wife's name was. And people don't necessarily say, we're just going to carve out this niche and we're going to try and make it as small as possible. That's one thing that I feel like when you change the UI, you do, you, you almost are forced to do that. So I love that you took that approach and it made you think about it in that way. The other piece that I have to ask about because this came up in the LLMs in production survey that we put out and a lot of people are having questions on how to quantify the ROI of your feature that now has AI in it and I think that you are a perfect person to ask because basically you took something that 
I don't think you can. Are you charging more for the AI feature? That's, I guess, the first question. No, it's 100% free to use for anybody. We even have our, our sandbox. So like it's a part of the UI that you don't even need to sign in or have a team. You can just use it. And we even have it enabled there. So this is huge because you took your tool and you now basically cut some of the margins so that you could be using AI, right? So how did you think about that? Because now you're making open AI API calls or whatever, if you're using Anthropic or Cohere, or I imagine you might want to try and start using open source when a good one comes out, but we can get to that later because I know you mentioned that the open source models are just, there's a lot left to be desired back in that blog post. So I'm curious if anything has changed, but let's hit on that in just a second. And let's stay on this ROI cost or the ROI idea, because for me, it's fascinating to think you said, we're going to create an AI feature and we're not going to charge people extra for it. But now because of the AI feature, we're having, essentially we're getting less profit. So um, there's there's a couple pieces to that. So the first is, so you're going to have to deal with cost, not even directly, but indirectly with rate limiting. So OpenAI has a set number of tokens per minute that they allow you to process. And if you go over that, well, too bad. And that's per API key. So like maybe you could multiplex API keys for users and all that. And some companies are trying to force users to like provide their own API key, which is total uh-huh. bullshit. Like, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's just not, that's not a business model. That's not the future. Um, and so like you, you, you have to deal with the problem of the amount of tokens you're passing and the amount of tokens you're getting back one way or another. Like if your if your feature is successful, you're going to hit rate limiting. If it's, you know, if it's successful, it's also going to cost a lot. So like do work to reduce the size of your prompt, reduce the, the number of inputs that you pass in. And that's hard shit. That's not easy, but like, it's good to do. The second thing is on the cost front, try to accurately an- analyze your costs a little bit. We did that, we did some forecasting. So like I looked at, so we have manual querying in the product and there's a certain volume of that that all of our customers do over a given month. And so I took like the average over the past months and looked at the general trend and I'm like, okay, here's like about a million or so queries that are run against our, you know, in this month, there were about a million queries that were run, manual queries, I should say. Uh, So people like literally clicking around and typing stuff in our UI and clicking the run query button. Uh, That was run a million times over one of the months. And I'm like, all right, cool. So people are going to be running those manual queries a lot more than the natural language queries, because it's very easy to just sort of like tweak one particular field and execute again. It's, It's designed to be fast that way. But let's assume for a moment that it's a million queries that are going to get run per month. Okay, we can work back from that and we can look at our cost. And we did. And it was like, all right, this will cost us about 100 grand a year in OpenAI bill. 100 grand a year is far less than the cost of a single engineer. And so that's just not that big of a deal. Like we, we sponsor conferences that cost 70 grand per sponsorship. And it's like, all right. Like th- this is, this is, yeah, it's money, but like, this is not that big. Like if we're like, we're, so we're a growth stage startup. We're, you know, in the tens of millions of ARR per, per year, but like a hundred grand for something that could potentially bring in a lot more new users is yeah. cheap. Really? Yeah. And like, that's also the difference between GBD 3.5 and GBD 4. If it was with GBD 4, that would cost um in the tens of millions per year and that's not something that we could do and so like part of that goes back to like hey this is hard stuff prompting is hard you can't always use the magical model that's supposedly the best or whatever you you have to work with the one that is going to actually fit with all your different constraints and if that means putting in more elbow grease with your prompting so that you still get accurate outputs from that thing then you got to do that work yeah but that's solely on the cost side i also want to talk like the roi like what we get out of this um, so there's two things to consider. First, uh, I have a very good relationship with our sales team and our sales team has been complaining for a long time that people who come in through the sales pipeline would look at our UI and be like, whoa, this is a little hard to use. And there was just too much handholding they had to do to like get them to feel comfortable with it. And like, yeah, in enterprise sales, you can get that, but they're like, we want to spend our time more effectively. And like every week we have to spend teaching people how to use it is a week lost on like getting that deal signed, right? So like there's there's real money on the line as far as that's concerned. And 
they were with us giving us feedback the entire time and that helped sort of shape what we want to do here and then at the end uh, after about a month or so if it was out they came back and they're like this is legitimately saving time for some of our prospects they see the box and they type into it and they go oh neat and they sometimes complain to us about it but they're like we want those complaints because like they're they're not asking us to handle how to use it they're just fucking going for it yeah. um so that's number one this is harder to quantify but in general, if your sales team is saying that something is making their jobs easier, that's a really good thing. The second thing is like a lot of different companies, we have a product-led growth um, initiative, which is the idea is that people come in through the free tier and then a certain percentage, you know, starts paying us money in, in like our, our paid tier. And, you know, they sort of, sometimes they'll just stay there or sometimes they will talk to enterprise sales and be like, hey, we're, we want to really go for, for real on this thing. And that acts as a funnel for our sales pipeline, and it also builds a part of the business that's uh, self, completely self-sustaining if, um, mm -hmm. if there were no humans involved in the process. The biggest problem from the product side, so like there's a problem in terms of getting people in to, do, to begin with. And then there's a, a stage where they need to get data in, so they need to like use an, an SDK or a tool that usually through the, the open telemetry project that generates the data, I'm pointed at Honeycomb and get it in there. But then after that, the largest drop off in that funnel was writing a fucking query and getting results. That was that was number one. And so we're like, OK, we tried all these other experiments beforehand and we were able to move the needle a little bit, but like not a whole lot. And so we have these these metrics that we tracked of like, you know, OK, what percentage of teams create what we consider a complex query, which is to say. They create a query that has one or more group buys and one or more filters. So they're like, live, they're really analyzing their data. We also have a feature called a board. It's a way to save a query to, uh, you know, in a collection of queries and in sort of this, it's like this collection of executable queries that you can look at. And we find that if a user creates a complex query or if a user adds a query to a board, they tend to be hardcore activated. Like there's a very high chance they're going to start paying us money later nice. down the road. So we're like, all right, if we get those numbers up, they're probably going to increase, you know, the other numbers. Um, so we found after a month of looking at the data with new teams coming in at the start of May, from May to June, there were a percentage of teams that never used the query assistant and a percentage of teams that did use the query assistant. Um, of the teams that did use the query assistant, the percentage that went on to create a complex query was more than twice the percentage that did not use query assistant. So like oh, the wow. jump was from from like a hundred percent of that population down to thirty six percent of that population in the in that was using query assistant. For the ones who were not using query assistant, hundred percent of that population dropped down to like fifteen percent. So like from a jump from fifteen percent to thirty six percent. The second one uh, in adding a query to a board, the jump was from six percent to I think it's, it's almost 17%. Yeah, almost 17%. So again, like uh, that one was almost three times the amount, but like they're, that's quantifiable. Like, you know, this isn't, this isn't total magic, but you Absolutely. know, at the end of the day, like, you know, you're not going to get massive numbers for this kind of stuff, but these are jumps that none of our previous experience were, and none of our previous experiments were able to get even remotely close to. Um, and so like, you know, it's only been two months. So we don't have like we're not raining in in dollars right now because of this but we're like hey we have these things that we are highly confident are able to move the business forward and we're able to see significant jumps in those things so now we're like okay how do we make the query assistant much more prominent for new people who are coming in because there were people who never even noticed it and we're like okay like it's able to yield these better outcomes so let's really get their their eyes on this thing but like already we think the ROI is worth it just based off those two factors. Feedback from sales saying this is helping them with that initial part of the cycle, which decreases the time it takes to get a deal signed. And then the second is on the self-serve side of the business, significant increases, like the largest increases in conversion that we've ever seen um, with the experiments that we've been doing as a result of this thing getting out there. Dude, so just having these leading indicators that you picked out and you said you know what if we can move the needle on these then we know the rest of the dominoes are going to fall that is so good to be able to try and use that as your target because then it's clear if our ai initiative 
it increases the usage here of these metrics, then we're good. And we know that the ROI is there, especially if we're just talking, I mean, just, I say just with hand quotations, if we're just talking about a hundred grand a year, then it's a whole different scenario because potentially the average sale price for somebody when they do get into that fully activated zone is much higher than a hundred grand a year. So you're saying if we can just get one of these people to activate fully from this feature, it's all worth it. And so now I'm, I'm thinking about the idea of you and from where you sit in your vantage point being so deep in the product space, but also knowing that lots of people in this podcast, people that come to this podcast, listen to it, and they're sitting in a machine learning engineering space. They're sitting in a data science space. How do you, A, did you already have those metrics picked out? How do you pick them out? How can you give advice to people that are in the machine learning engineering space to think more like a product person? Because if there's one thing that I have seen over the last whatever X amount of months doing all these hackathons with AI, it's that now everyone is a product person. The ability to use AI and some people call it, you know, like the democratization of AI Although I think that's a little bit like overplaying it because there's still some really hard stuff that has to come along with it. And you need, a lot of times you need some serious engineers to implement this. You can't just have some front end web developer create something that can be at scale. But I do think that everyone now is looking at their position and they're thinking about how can I bring more of a product mindset to what I'm doing? And so... From your vantage point, you mapped out some very clear things. You're talking to different stakeholders like sales. I imagine you're talking to a lot of different people. So maybe you can go into that a little bit. And then you're also saying, here's some leading metrics that we're looking at. And just if we can affect those metrics, the rest of the initiative is worth it. And so from a machine learning engineering perspective, how can we help identify those metrics? How can we look at who we should be talking to so that we can also be part of this conversation? That's a good question. So I think what this is fundamentally rooted in is you shouldn't be looking for, you know, it, it, it's it's kind of a classic thing, right? Like there's this amazing technology, but you shouldn't be taking the technology and looking for a problem to solve with it. You should be looking for a problem to solve and seeing if the technology can be used to solve it. And that's the mindset that we had in this was this very scoped problem of people coming in and being able to be successful with querying for the first time. And uh, on the product side of it, like, again, this is th this this is something that I did and some other people on the product team did, but you can be in the ML side and do this too. Literally just talking to some of these people, talking to some of the customers who are much more early stage, working with someone to get like emails of people who signed up who are on the free tier and just chatting with them and being like, hey, why did you use this product? What questions are you trying to ask? Like, what are you trying to get out of this? And you find after about five or six of these relatively short interviews, um, there's patterns that emerge. And in our case, the pattern was, well, I cared about my latency or my errors usually, or like, you know, user behavior. And I want to see, I want to see that. And then you go, okay, well, what is that? And they're like, well, you know, I, uh, they, they often like struggle to uh, explain what they want to see. And that's part of why they, they came to our product. You don't have to be a product manager. You don't have to sit in the product org to be able to do this sort of legwork. Once you do that, you can then take a step back and be like, okay, are these problems that are worth solving? And if they are, okay, let's identify some good metrics that are worth like, okay, this is how we're going to be able to start quantifying it. It's really good to have a product person there, especially if you have a product person with a background in growth product work, they're going to be really, really helpful at this because those people are amazing at knowing what is trackable today and what could be tracked and like what work needs to go in there to instrument it so it can be tracked. Um, and then saying, okay, like, you know, just framing it up, like, okay, if you see a percentage increase of this amount, that usually means it's good or means it's maybe not so good and just give you a better sense for like, this is what we could, it, like if we, what we view as success or what we view as failure, we can have some bounds around that. When you have that in place, it's it's basically go time at that point. Like, I mean, I took it a step further and worked with sales because, it, you know, we're, we, we have a large enterprise sales arm of our business. And it turns out that their problems 
were the same as these problems. Like we're just complete alignment across organizations. Um, you know, again, you don't have to be a product person to do this sort of work, but talking to those people and sort of identifying where all the common points are and then working with somebody in product or doing it yourself to figure out those metrics you want to move, uh, you can do. But then I think this question can be answered in two different ways. I think like, A, there's that work, especially on the initial legwork that ML engineers can be deep, much more deeply involved with than perhaps they might be today. The second piece of that is I think product managers should be working with ML folks a little bit more and becoming a bit more data literate because they may like, you know, it, it's hard to develop a deep rooted understanding of how users are using your product. But if a product manager can like bring in that expertise and an ML person can sort of come at it from the other direction and have some of this like, hey, I'm talking to users, I'm identifying some of these problems. You have a common language that you can speak. And if the product person is able to say, hey, I know what embeddings are. I know why they're useful. I know like what is good or bad about LLMs in general, like things where they can fall down. You can really, really start iterating quickly. Um, and I think it's essential. Like I, I think the ML folks are going to have to be more product minded. They're going to have to learn how to do more of this legwork to better understand a problem. And then I think the product folks are going to have to get more data minded basically to better understand like, okay, these are our data, like these are the systems that we can work with. And these are our data sources and how they're sort of laid out and what we can do with that. I think before LLMs and like how easy it was to just sort of call an API and get something kind of halfway decent, right. there was just a lot of work that went into like getting a halfway decent ML model into production that now is not, that it doesn't take as much effort anymore. But all that other work with like quality of data and making sure we have the right data pipelines in place, like... It, it's still there. I think like the, a lot of the focus is going to shift on, on that and, and, you know, making sure that you're collecting the right information in the first place to like, mm. be your source of info that you're going to feed to an ML model. And, um, I don't know how much of like, you know, I, I think that like, as more organizations are able to adopt machine learning, there's going to be more of a need to be able to set up these kinds of systems. And so there's going to be a higher need for ML folks who are really focused on ensuring that data is in a good state. And then also being able to work with product people to be like, all right, cool. When is a good time that we can take a snapshot of what's live and build an evaluation system based off of real user behavior so that we can then say, okay, like this is how we're going to be able to iterate on this thing in, in the future. Because every product person knows the first thing you release is going to kind of suck in some ways. So like, how do you make it not suck anymore? Like that's kind of one of the keys to doing that. Our skill sets are going to be put a little bit into a blender, I think. I'm all for it because I think on both sides, we we could stand to it and improve our, our skill sets and, and change how we work. So I love that because there is something that you spoke about where it come, when it comes to just hitting an API and making it really easy for someone to go out and get something up and running really quickly, which was not possible before. And there was always that, that that came out with like every MLOps tool marketing where it said, you know, 80% of machine learning or AI initiatives never make it into production. And now I think I haven't seen that stat for years because you just hit an API, but there's a whole other slew of problems, which you mentioned on the front end where it's collecting the data or the security part of it and how you make sure that there's no prompt injections or just prompting in, in general, how that works. But when it comes to iterating and figuring out how to better your whole system, do you see yourselves going towards using open source models? I mean, for you, I know you mentioned in the blog that the open source models aren't that interesting and they're just not as good as what you can get off the shelf right now. But I also wonder if that is something that you have mapped out with the product roadmap. It doesn't seem like the cost would be a reason for you to do it. So I guess it would be for some other reason, like maybe the rate limit. Or I know that a lot of people complain about how OpenAI updates its model every other week, and then it completely changes things. So if you're at mercy to an update, that can really mess up your AI feature. So I just, I wonder how you think about that and if it's better not to have full control and bring it in-house. Yeah, it's it, it's really about that. Um, cost is not really an issue for us. 
Well, it's about it's about really two things. So first, uh, if we have full control over the model and it's running in our infra infrastructure, then yeah, that's great. We could even fine tune it to be potentially even more accurate. To be honest, the bar is going to be pretty high there because OpenAI is pretty great at being accurate already, and it's super super easy to use. And so you know the ROI there um, compared to an open source model running in our own infrastructure. Like it's got a high bar to, to, to cross. Now, like I, I think that there's sufficient motivation in our industry to build those things. So it's super easy to take an off the shelf open source model. Like, you know, there's gonna be like a marketplace of models all sort of better suited for specific tasks and sort of say, all right, cool. This is the one we're gonna use. And you know, this is the shape of the data it needs to be in to fine tune it. And we're gonna click a button and it's gonna upload the data and it's gonna fine tune it. And then in three hours, we're gonna have it available for us to, to use. If that existed, we would probably consider that later this year, uh, but right now it doesn't. And so the amount of time and money that we would spend into trying to use that only to get something potentially better than OpenAI, no guarantee that it's better, is like, well, all right. Or we could wait for OpenAI to release an even better model. And ta-da, there we go. Th that's kind of where our, our mindset is. I mean, I mm -hmm. think like, you know, being at the mercy of OpenAI's model changes and model latency, which I've complained about several times, actually, which, you know, they're they're working on. That's that's also motivation, but it's not posed a problem enough to the point where we need to make a move. Now, if we were starting all over again, I think we would still go the same route that we are right now, just because it's still not easy enough to take an open source model and fine tune it and use it the way that we want to. So also looking forward and thinking about where you're going to take the product next, I know you mentioned how right now agents or the chaining of API calls are off the table. And that is because, and you, again, you articulated this perfectly. It's something that I have in my head, but I wasn't able to really say, but it's like, hey, if the agent or if one of your API calls has a let's say 90% accuracy rate, if all of a sudden you start chaining three or four of those together, the accuracy rate starts to go down very quickly. And I think anybody that's played around with auto GPT or baby AGI, they have felt that pain firsthand. And so when it comes to chaining, do you feel like that is something that you're going to try to do in the future? Or is it again, one of those things where, yeah, it's not that interesting because we have something that's working and the scope that we're looking at, it doesn't need it. For Query Assistant, the, the feature that we shipped, we won't be using Chainier agents, I think, ever um, because it's it seems like it's it's pretty much doing its job. So, you know. But there are other parts of our products that are more, I use, I, I use an analogy, compile time versus runtime. So uh, Query Assistant is a runtime concern, so it needs to be fast. If it's a little bit less accurate, it's okay because it's very easy to correct things and a user can take over at any point. There are other parts of our product that are more compile time concerns. And so having an agent or a chain that you spend, so like is it, it is less accurate over time to an extent. There are techniques that you can do to sort of make things more accurate over time, but it significantly increases your latency, which mm -hmm. is why it's not a good fit for yeah. this part of our product. But for other parts of our product where there's a lot of upfront, like, hey, if it takes three or four minutes to execute, but the end result is really, really good, then that's a worthy trade-off. It's just that the querying feature is, that's not the right place to put that sort of thing. I do like this idea of when you're looking at trade-offs, what are the most important? And if you really have to focus on latency, then chaining is not the option, no matter how good the end result is. So... Dude, Philip, this has been awesome, man. I knew it was going to be great. I did not realize it was going to be so good. It was well worth the wait to chat with you. I think we can end it there. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention? Oh, so we are hiring, but then also um, I'm in currently involved in a project right now of taking observability practices into this whole like people deploying stuff with LLMs and trying to iterate. And so if, if anybody, it, whether you're an ML engineer or you're another product manager or whatever, if you're like, hey, we're going to put something in production and it's going to be like V0.1, how do we get from 0.1 to 1.0 as effectively as possible? I would love to chat with you. 
uh, and you know, my info should be in the show notes or something like that. You could also email me, email me directly at philip at honeycomb.io. And, uh, I'd love to have that conversation because whether observability practices are the right thing or not, um, for the problems you're trying to solve, that's something I'm trying to figure out as well, too. Uh, there might be a version of honeycomb that could work well for these sorts of problems or there might not be, right? This is a discovery sort of thing. So that's, um, that's what I'm currently sort of after. And anybody who's interested, I'd, I'd love to chat. I love that. And I also want to chat with these people, man. That's a great, great initiative. So I'm excited. I, I love what you put out. I love the work that you're doing. And we'll leave all of the blogs that you've written in the show notes. And I'm going to try and propose that you write a few more from this conversation, or maybe I'll just distill what you said into a blog. Now, Philip, this was great, man. Have a great day. We'll end it there. Thank you. This is Skylar. I lead machine learning at Health Rhythms. If you want to stay on top of everything happening in MLOps, subscribe to this podcast now. 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 Thank you.